My name is Kate Drankoff. I am the Cyber Advisors Marketing Manager, and we are excited for a fun day of content first, and then we'll get into some grilling tips with barbecue with Boderman. I'm going to just give it a few more minutes here because I'm trying to admit the lobby as I talk here. It's so good to see some familiar faces, names, new faces and names. And we really miss seeing you guys in person, but things are going on. So it's good to do it virtual. I'm so glad we can still get in front of you guys. Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, like I said, if you have, my name is Kate. I'm the Cyber Advisors Marketing Manager. Um, I've worked with the Arctic Wolf team now for over three and a half years. Um, we are one of their first partners in the Twin Cities area and their team is amazing. Um, I'm gonna hand things over to Nick Prince and just right before I get started, I'm just gonna mention that we are recording today because I had a few people who couldn't make it. And if you have questions throughout, just go ahead and type in the chat or use the raise the hand feature or interrupt, we are here to help. And then, we'll, like I said, we'll go over some of the content first, and then we are going to get into the grilling tips and tricks with barbecue with Boderman. And I went ahead and sent out all the gift cards, either the Instacart ones were e-gift cards, but the barbecue ones for Northern barbecue, Fire Barbecue were physical ones, so they should arrive within the next few days. So thank you so much, and I'm going to hand things over to Nick Prince. Great, thanks, Kate. And... Uh... Uh, thanks again for inviting us. You know, we, we've been partnered with Cyber since day one. So um, it's it's awesome to to see that partnership grow, uh, to work and, and and partner with your customers with our solutions. And um, yeah, thanks again for having us today. I, I'll try to be quick. I'm really looking forward to to seeing some steaks at the grill or, or the pan or however, um, however that's going down today. Um, I, I love eating, love cooking. So, so definitely looking forward to it. Um, so my name, Nick Prince, I, I work as a sales engineer here at Arctic Wolf. Uh, been here a couple of years, work out of the um, our headquarters here in Eden Prairie covering the area. Uh, so great to great again to have the opportunity to, to say hi to everyone and, and be a part of this today. Um, I'll go ahead and get things started with a quick little um, quick little story here. Um, so when I started my career a long time ago, um, I worked for a, a pretty small MSP around here. Um, we, we would work with organizations that had zero IT folks, so we'd do their server admin work, we'd, we'd work with their ISPs, their firewalls, printers, laptops, really really kind of everything. So a little bit of a jack of all trades. Um, one day my boss came up to me and said, hey, can you go to one of our marketing clients? Can you rack a server up and um, do, some, do some work out there? Um, I had a couple other tickets to work on while I was on site, so definitely had, had some work to do and, and um, was uh, kind of plugging away. Um, when I was in the server room, uh, I, I had the VP come in and, and tap me on the shoulder and let me know that email wasn't working. And uh, personally, I knew exactly what had happened right away. Um, I had uh, I had been into a couple of different servers. I had shut down the wrong one. Um, this marketing company, heavy email, hundreds of users. So I had just taken down uh, that service for them. So uh, the whole reason for the story isn't to to tell you guys that I'm a horrible admin, um, that I that you, you don't want to hire me. Um, really what I remember about that was kind of the feeling I had um, when I realized the mistake I had made. And um, I, you know, I can only imagine what folks are, are feeling when they're seeing you know, images like this come up on their screen, um, when they're dealing with uh, security events, breaches, um, you know, whatever I had felt, I'm sure it's tenfold. Uh, for the organizations that have had to go through this. So um, really here to, to, to talk about how we can help, um, you know, what, what we're seeing in the market, you know, a big challenge that, um, that we're helping address, that, that we're seeing customers kind of work through. Um, one, the breaches are happening. They, they keep increasing year over year. Um, the costs of the events are going up. Um, you know, the big Fortune 500s, they can weather the storm typically. They can either pay the ransom or, or have the downtime. Uh, but a lot of smaller organizations, they, they, they can't, they don't survive. The bottom right has a stat that 60% of those uh, small organizations don't, don't survive a breach. Um, the, the other number on the right that, that really speaks to kind of where we're trying to help is that time to identify uh, those bad actors or those security events uh, that are happening in, in our customers' environments. 
on average, it takes over 200 days to identify those. And as you can imagine, if a bad actor's had that much time in your environment, uh, when they go to execute um, their attack or their event, it's pretty painful for customers. Uh, really, our goal is to bring that down to minutes or less. Um, so that's one of the problems we're seeing. Um, folks are also just having a challenge getting the expertise needed to, to address security within their organization. Um, the, the talent shortage out there is, is real, especially in Minnesota. Um, and, and finding those folks is a challenge. And even when you do find the folks um, to, to help you, they're expensive. It's costly to the organization. You need to, one, find the right fit for your company. You need to be able to retain them. Um, and a lot of times these folks um, are able to go get a, a salary increase or move somewhere else. So really just a lot of challenges out there today um, uh, from a security perspective. Um, again, some more metrics to back that up. Attacks are up. Um, more than 61% of companies had a ransomware attack in 2020. So, uh, you know, it's really not the case maybe five, 10 years ago where, where the big um, financials or healthcare organizations were, were the targets. Um, we're talking to people every day, uh, you know, small organizations down to, to 10, 15 employees um, that are having to deal with some type of event. So it's not not a case where um, really, you know, folks aren't a target anymore. Really, everyone's kind of a, a target in today's um, landscape. Um, and, then, and then finally, again, for, for a lot of organizations, if they're down for a day or two, um, they, they're, they're really not able to sustain that and, and survive that type of attack. So um, again, just to, to frame up some of the conversations we're having, some of the issues we're seeing, um, and, and really some of the motivators that, that organizations have to look at either continuing to invest in security or looking at partnering with an organization like ourselves. Uh, one, certainly, you know, malicious activity, a breach, an event that's occurred, you know, that can help, you know, take you to your leadership and say, hey, these are some ways to help prevent that from happening in the future. Um, that's a big driver. If you're an organization that has compliance or governance, um, obviously you have to, to meet those requirements and, and we're able to help there with some of our services. Um, some organizations have gone down the route to to do it themselves, and they just aren't getting the outcomes that they're expecting. It is it is a hard uh, job to have security operations within an organization, um, to have the right tooling, the people, processes, uh, the 24 by 7 coverage. Um, it, it's a tall task, and a lot of organizations go down that route and just aren't seeing the value that that they were expecting. Um, you know, I, 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 we talk to a lot of people every day. Um, most organizations I talk to, IT is wearing a bunch of different hats, um, including security and, um, and server admin, network. Um, so the, the, it seems like the companies are always asking teams to do more with less. And um, when it comes to security, you know, sometimes that expertise just isn't there. Um, or, or you might lose somebody. Maybe you have made that investment um, and that individual has taken a job somewhere else and now you're kind of um, stuck with their, their tooling and, and their processes and their scripts that um, the team doesn't know about. So um, that's another big gap. And then uh, the last one is, is cyber insurance. I'll, I'll probably spend a little bit more time talking about that today uh, versus some of these other drivers. Um, and I think when you look at the, the faces at the bottom, I kind of love, love the, the smiley and, and not happy faces. But, um, you know, if, if you're an organization that hasn't had a breach, you don't have compliance, there really isn't any pain. Um, you know, it, it might be a matter of time before that happens, um, but I think cyber insurance is certainly an area where um, organizations where, you know, they haven't felt some of those drivers today um, are starting to feel them because they're either um, losing coverage, they're trying to get it and they can't, um, and, and their, their, their green faces are getting a little yellow or orange. So um, we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about cyber insurance and, and kind of how we align to that and, and help out there. Um, what we're seeing in the market when we talk to these organizations um, that we're partnering with or when we talk to cyber insurance companies or um, underwriters or uh, brokers for, for these organizations, um, they, they've, they've had a challenge. A lot of ransomware has been paid out. Um, insurance companies like to make money and, and they really haven't been uh, profitable uh, in the past year. So uh, what they're doing, what we're seeing as a result of that is one, reduced coverage. So folks that have um, policies in place or are trying to get it might not get the coverage that they've seen in the past. Uh, we're seeing increased rates for um, our, our customers and organizations out there um, where their, their policies might go up 20 to 50% um, as far as the premiums needed. Um, and even if, 
uh, you, you as an organization, you're able to um, take that reduced coverage. You're able to pay the increased rates. Um, we're seeing some organizations not able to renew or get cyber insurance just based on uh, some of the new requirements they have, some of the, the controls that need to be in place within your organization, some of the, the tooling that's needed. Um, cyber companies, are their underwriters are taking a little bit more inspection on, on that for organizations and, and either denying coverage or forcing customers to uh, make changes before they can go through that renewal. Can Nick, can we just pause for a second? We have some good questions in the chat. Oh, okay. um, and I can read them. Oh, I can totally read about them. Okay. So Robert asked, did any customers turn to Arctic Wolf post breach? Yes. Yep. So, you know, back to that driver, um, we, you know, we, if we talk to those customers, their first call should be to, um, you know, the police, it should be to their insurance companies. Um, and start working through that process. A lot of times um, insurance organizations will have their own IR teams come in and, and do um, the forensics post event. Uh, but that, that typically is a driver for organizations to then you know, take another look at their security uh, posture, look at maybe other partnerships that might help them avoid that breach in the future. Um, and we see a lot of activity based on that. So um, we might not be the ones that you come to immediately after the breach, but when you're trying to find ways to prevent that in the future, um, that's absolutely a goal of our services and partnership. That was a great question. Thank you. Um, we have another question too, and this might, we might have to flip back a few slides. Why the significant drop in breaches in 2018 and records exposed in 2019? Yeah, and, and you know, there's a lot of graphs out there. I'm, I'm not sure maybe the reason behind that, you know, some that I'm assuming those are all reported incidents and breaches. Um, you know, a lot of them aren't reported. You know, a lot of customers that um, have experienced a breach don't necessarily always have to report that or uh, make that public information. Um, although they are, again, you know, looking for ways to prevent that in the future. So it might've just been a situation where um, either activity was down um, for that time period, or uh, perhaps maybe some of the um, events weren't going reported. Fantastic. And then just one more in the chat for now. Um, and we might still be getting to this, but what size company does Arctic Wolf feel as their target customer as well? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'd say size doesn't really matter too much when it comes to our services. We support organizations that um, through our MSP programs that are, you know, less than 10 employees. We have some of our largest customers are 50,000 plus employees. So um, they, they might have different needs and different requirements coming out of our services, uh, but we're able to help all of them in some uh, form or, or fashion when it comes to um, the, the services we are providing. You know, if, I mean, I'd say if a, if a customer doesn't have a firewall in place or they don't um, have any antivirus, you know, maybe those are the first steps for the organization and then uh, talk to Arctic Wolf, but when it comes to the size of the customer, um, we really support um, the whole spectrum out there. That's great. Thank you so much, Nick. Yeah. We can resume. Yeah, and please interrupt me as as, <laughs> as I'm talking here if, if we need to. So, um, all right. So some of the controls, um, again, that you know, the areas where those green spaces might get unhappy. Uh, the cyber companies are forcing organizations to, to have some either tools in place, processes in place. Um, I hear multi-factor pretty much all the time. Um, it seems like that's one that they're pushing very hard. Um, secured endpoints is another one. So having um, some logging on the endpoint, having some tooling there. Um, and then there are other controls. You certainly need backups. You need to um, do scans and, and understand where patches are needed, where, where you have vulnerabilities in the environment. Um, if you go to put in a claim and you have a, you know, an OS that's not supported, I'm, you know, I'm not sure if that claim will go through if you're not, you know, addressing some of those or at least um, having audits and 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 tracking that. Um, so that's certainly an area. Um, but it, these 12 controls really are are kind of what we're seeing surface right now. Again, as we talk to those brokers, as we talk to the insurance companies, um, and and these are what underwriters are at least. You know, asking questions around um, it might be open to interpretation when you respond to those questionnaires or um, or work with them. But these these are some of the main components we're seeing. Um, you know, we we certainly help um, provide a good story around a lot of these controls. You can see the half circle is where um, a lot of cases where we're 
either pulling in those logs or monitoring those tools for our customers. Um, and then the, the other areas where we completely solve for, you can see a few of those here. Um, so really kind of the, the message here is um, with cyber insurance, it, it's getting harder. Um, there's more inspection on it. Um, our services certainly help. You know, if you're talking to your insurance company and, um, and you are an article of customer or looking at us, um, you know, we'd love to have a conversation, let them know what we're doing, let them know what controls we're helping um, solve for, for for your organization and hopefully either, you know, help with those premiums, help with the coverage or at least help you, you know, get the get the policy in place. And we did have one more question come in. Um, it is, do you consult with customers implementing HIPAA slash high trust certifications and or compliancy? Yeah, so um, so HIPAA and, and high trust and PCI and FDIC and, and all those um, regulations out there today, we're, we're not we're not there to help you get the certification or do an audit, uh, but our services help support a lot of the controls um, in those um, in those areas, and then also things like the NIST framework and CIS controls. Um, so when you do have to go get that certification or you are going through uh, one of those audits. Um, we're able to help provide artifacts around what our services are doing, how we're configured um, to support those controls that are needed. Now, if, if you want some help to understand where your gaps are um, and, and maybe do an assessment, that, that's where cyber advisors and their team um, really are, are able to shine for, for the gaps maybe that we're not filling um, and, and can certainly help you out there. But definitely the customers that are leveraging our services um, when it comes to that audit and that compliance we're checking a lot of those boxes for them. Thank you, Nick. Yep. Um, okay, so switching a little bit away from um, cyber insurance and, and I'll, I'll kind of just talk about us for a little bit here. And um, really our goal isn't to be another product for you. We're not an MFA tool to go buy. We're not an endpoint product. Um, we're not on the network. We're not a new firewall. Um, our, our approach is to uh, work with our customers, take what they've invested in, optimize that stack, uh, work with their tools, um, and provide a, a security operations service and outcome uh, back to them. Um, we do that in a unique way. Um, uh, our, our entire, uh, our entire go-to-market, our entire partnership is, is a managed service. So we're not, um, we're not, you know, forcing customers to go um, deploy tooling or, or rip and replace what they have versus Hey, send us the data you have. Uh, we'll work with you and your tools. Um, we have some technology that we can deliver with our um, open XDR architecture that allows us to, to get more information, telemetry around your environment, more detection capabilities. Um, we take a holistic approach, uh, wanting to make sure we, we have coverage around your users, your endpoints, your servers, your um, network, your SaaS and IS deployments. All of that data will feed to our platform um, our platform is fully hosted, managed by us, so no care and feed, uh, feeding needed by you and your team. You don't have to deploy appliances, carve out compute storage, or anything like that. Um, the the services at the top, I'll, I'll really just touch on those quickly. Uh, the managed detection and response, this is where we are um, pulling in all your log sources. We're looking at every single alert that's coming out of your environment on a 24 by 7 basis, and then working with you on any remediation that's needed. Um, so if you think of like a home security system, this is us understanding if somebody's you know gotten into your home or if there's a fire or a flood that's happening, um, we detect that as fast as possible and, and make you aware of it so that that you can take action. Um, we do that you know on-prem, cloud, again, working where you have deployments and where you have um, your environment uh, and your technologies. Uh, manage risk, this is this is more of a continuous uh, vulnerability scanning service. so, what we're doing here is we're looking for those um, systems on your network, your endpoints. We do external scans here to see if there are any, um, you know, vulnerabilities, patches needed, zero days that are present, um, and, and make our, our customers aware of it. Again, analogy here is um, if it is a home security system, this is where we're looking at your window sensors and telling you that your, you know, upstairs bedroom window is open or uh, your garage door was left open, um, stuff like that, letting you know where folks might be able to uh, take advantage as your organization uh, against your organization and your environment um, and letting you know how to resolve that you know if that is shutting the door or locking it um, or applying the patch that's needed on a server 
Um, and then the, our final kind of core service is managed security awareness. This is where we uh, really focus on your people, your employees. Um, through this program, we enable them, we empower them to uh, really understand what's happening uh, in the, the threat landscape today. Um, we do this through um, continuous like video training. It's biweekly that it's delivered. It's either a video, um, a questionnaire, a quiz. And then we also have monthly phishing simulation. Really the goal again is to um, you know, make sure your users are aware of what to look for, what's suspicious, um, and, and how to work with you and your team to, to identify those threats that might be coming at them. Um, the last thing I'll, I'll kind of talk to on this page is the that concierge delivery model. Um, really one thing that, that kind of sets us apart from other solutions that are similar to this or, or services, um, everything is delivered through a named um, concierge security team. So all of our customers have security experts that are named to their accounts that work with them on all their strategic activities, their customizations, reporting, audits, questions, tickets. Um, they're there to really be an extension of your team. Um, they're unlimited. You, you can talk to them whenever you need to, reach out to them whenever you need to. Um, behind them, they have hundreds of people in our triage team that are looking at those alerts 24 by seven. Uh, but this named security model really is um, a, a lot of a big reason why a lot of customers move forward with us, and absolutely a reason why um, we're we're getting renewals with with our customers at a high rate today. So a couple more slides, and, and I'll be wrapped up here. Um, so for for customers that are investing in us, we we also invest in them. Um, so we have service assurance for organizations that have our MDR service and either uh, risk or managed security awareness. What we do is we provide up to $500,000 of coverage should an event happen um, or, or an issue where um, a, a claim could be made. And then if, if customers use all three of those core services um, and, and they um, purchase that for a three-year term, we provide up to a million dollars. So really, again, um, this, is, this is us investing back in our customers. They've looked to us to provide a service to protect their environments. And if, if we ever mess up or have an issue, um, we back dollars here. Um, this isn't to replace cyber insurance, but it but it definitely is a benefit. So um, again, if you are having troubles with, with your policies or coverage um, and, and you've made kind of an investment in us, we might be able to help provide some benefits back to you as an organization. Um, and then we do um, have a partnership with SciSurance just to uh, maybe touch on real quick here to, to wrap up. Um, so customers, again, that are that are investing in us, um, we've partnered with SciSurance. They're aware of our services and what we're providing. Um, and they've been able to, to, one, provide coverage, and then, two, uh, do it at, at a good cost for organizations. So there are a few limitations around the policy size and um, how much revenue a customer could have to be a part of this. Uh, but it certainly is an option for organizations that are, um, that are looking for, for cyber insurance out there. And Kate, that's all I had for today. Not sure if there no, were any other questions. Absolutely fantastic. Um, so much, sorry, I don't know if I was on audio yet. Um, if there's any other questions, you guys, you can absolutely put them in the chat. We went over quite a few questions as we went there. Oh, we have a hand up. Um, Alan, did you mean to put your hand up or have a question? Hey, yeah, I just, you know, I've, we've looked at some of this stuff before in the past. You can hear me, right? Yep. Yep, you're good. Okay. Um, cost is a big issue. You know, it's kind of like buying insurance for your car. You know, there, 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 there's some point. You know, you can insure yourself to death. And I mean, I know these tools are good, but I'm talking like for businesses that are, you know. Uh, you know, 10, 15 employees and things like that, but yet they still are critical, you know, depending on the, you know, the business is, um, the, the cost is just, it's too much. Yeah. You know? I, I think every business kind of struggles with risk and how much they want to take on. Um, I think we all do that in our personal lives and, and certainly from a business side of it. So um, really it comes down to, you know, your leadership being aware that, yeah, um, you know, we talk to a lot of folks that that do have cost issues and we say, hey, at least go through the effort of understanding what it looks like to continue to invest in in um, services like ours and security. 
uh, what it looks like to have insurance and present that to your leadership. And if they say no, then, you know, at least you've done the effort to say, hey, this is if something were to happen, you know, I showed you options to hopefully help prevent that um, and, and kind of have a, a conversation from that that standpoint. Uh, but totally get where you're coming from. Um, you know, a lot of those customers are the green faces where they haven't had pain um, or or a good reason to to go buy something um, or invest or partner with organizations like us. And um, you know, hopefully, it's it's not a big event that that kind of changes their mind versus um, you know other activities that that might be less painful to the, the organization. Okay, thanks. And we and we do carry cyber insurance too, you know. But the thing is, you know, what does it really cover? Uh, in the event you have a something, you know, yeah, you didn't, read the, you didn't read the fine print that somebody clicked on something and that they weren't supposed to, yeah. and that's not covered. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and hopefully, hopefully, I we we definitely we aren't a cyber insurance company. We are security operations. We do um, security services. Um, it's just been such a hot topic for us for customers that you know have it or are looking at it um, that that you know we spent a little bit of time talking about it today. Should, can we bring on maybe Amanda quick to plug or Greg to plug the event that we also have coming up that dives more into cyber insurance? Oh, maybe not. I'll, you know what, I'll include it in the details of a follow-up email, but basically Arctic Wolf is hosting a webinar, I believe, on the 25th, and it's a pizza cast, but they're going to dive more into, um, especially for MSP customers, more about cyber insurance, what you need to know, things like that too, for people who have questions around that as well. Um, is there any other questions for Nick? And I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat. So if you guys want to throw anything in there, I'll, I'll stay on and I can help out that way too. Perfect. Thank you. I think we're ready to hand things over to Barbecue with Boderman. I will say we've worked with Andy before and he is so fun. <laughs> he is great at what he does. He also has an interesting story and kind of comes from an IT background too. Maybe he can touch on that. But he's sure. made this really awesome career for himself and we're gonna have a lot of fun today. Absolutely, uh, thank you guys. Uh, the number one thing uh, that I would like everybody to know is I like to keep this really loose. I don't want this to feel like a presentation in any way. Uh, so at any point, uh, if you wanna come off mute, ask questions, uh, please do. It doesn't have to be, you know, steak specific. I know that's what we're doing here today, but uh, any sort of culinary questions that you have, uh, I'm totally here for you. So yeah, uh, I'm Andy. Uh, I, I started Barbecue with Boderman a couple years ago. And uh, the whole idea was kind of just to, to help people out. Uh, I, I've done a lot of cooking uh, throughout my entire life. Um, I never went to culinary school or anything like that, uh, but I just, I did it a lot and I nerded out over as much information as I could get my hands on, uh, watch a ton of Food Network and then just, just cooked uh, for a long time. And I had uh, a lot of friends and family uh, asking questions and helping out, I would help them out. Uh, and so I just kind of started doing it on a, on a little bit larger level. Uh, I started an Instagram page first. Um, uh, I'm also a photographer uh, and a food stylist. Uh, so if you go to BBQ with Boderman uh, on Instagram, you can kind of see some of the other stuff that I, I put up there. I, I uh, do a lot of recipe development. Uh, I work with a couple different companies uh, doing that, uh, as well as um, doing all sorts of product photography kind of outside of the food world. So yeah, and I actually used to, I, I recently uh, had a career change uh, but I used to work in the physical security space, uh, so I, I'm definitely adjacent to what you guys uh, are, are doing and talking about as far as cybersecurity is concerned. So that was my background for a long time. But uh, yeah, let's uh, let's get on with the uh, the cooking stuff. So first thing I like to talk about is drink pairings. Uh, I love a good drink. I'm sure most of you guys do as well. So. Uh, with steak, there's really kind of three directions you can go with an alcohol uh, pairing. Uh, my absolute favorite is red wine. Uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, scientifically speaking, uh, red wine uh, actually 
the tannins in red wine connect with the fat molecules that are on your palate as you're eating. Uh, and so every time you take a bite, uh, those tannins actually strip those fat molecules off your palate. So when you go back for another bite, uh, it's kind of like having the first bite all over again. Um, for specific types, uh, big cabs are definitely my favorite. I love that. Um, any sort of big red blend, as long as it's got a good tannic structure, that's what you're looking for. So, uh, yep, red wine. If you're not a wine person, uh, there's a couple different directions you can go with beer. Uh, I also come from the beer industry. I worked uh, for a couple uh, 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 craft breweries here in Minneapolis. So those of you who are local, uh, I used to work with Uda Pills, uh, And then before that, I was with Bauhaus. So my favorite beers to pair with a steak are typically lighter European styles, like a Helles, uh, Pilsner, Kolsch, things like that. Um, and, and Uda Pills makes some fantastic uh, beers to pair with steaks and that in that lighter European style. You can also go to the opposite end and go with your stouts and porters and things like that. Uh, one of the reasons is we're going to put a really good sear on this steak. And when you sear something, something happens called the Maillard reaction. Uh, and dark beers are actually made with roasted malts. Uh, and so a lot of those flavors play in together uh, and, and work really nice together. So porter stouts or lighter European styles. I'm going to take a sip of water here. If you're a liquor drinker, uh, bourbon is my absolute favorite with a steak. Um, going back to what I was talking about, about the, uh, the roasted malts and, and things like that in the sear, uh, bourbon is actually made in oak barrels that are charred on the inside. And so that char, that little bit of smoky flavor that bourbon has uh, and the sweetness that comes behind it, works really, really well with a steak. So straight up bourbon uh, is always good. If you need a cocktail, I highly suggest uh, an old fashioned, a um, little bit of sweetness, a little bit of citrus added in there. So that is fantastic for, those are my favorites for, for pairing with steaks. So if, uh, if you're gonna go out and get, get yourself a steak and get something to drink with it, pick one of those three. What I am working with today is a really fun steak. So this is called a bavette. Um, and it's, it, it got popular in France. Uh, they, they call it bavette, which just translates to bib. Uh, and what it is, is it's a cross section of a flank steak. And when you think flank steak, you usually think cheaper meat, uh, tacos, things like that. However, um, Northern Fire, uh, a lot of you guys are going to be getting uh, gift cards to Northern Fire. They sell American Wagyu steaks, uh, and they actually have the American Wagyu bavettes, which is absolutely one of my favorite steaks to make. Uh, so I actually picked one up to uh, cook for you guys today. So when you're there, if you want um, what I'm cooking, just ask them for a bavette. Okay. I'm also going to use this seasoning. Elk Creek, uh, one of my favorites for steaks. If you don't want to use the seasoning, I highly suggest just uh, salt and black pepper. Uh, I like to bring out and enhance the natural flavor of the steak, uh, as opposed to using rubs that have a lot of sugar in them. Uh, that's one of the reasons I really like this one, is there's not a ton of sugar in it. If you have uh, a rub that's got a lot of sugar, uh, it will actually start to burn in the pan as we go to uh, put that that sear on this steak. So I got that. And then I've also got some fresh thyme as well as fresh rosemary and two cloves of garlic. And then we're going to use grapeseed oil. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, but a cast iron pan, and that is pretty much all we're going to need for this steak cook. Uh, this is my absolute favorite way to do a steak. You can certainly, if you do want to use the grill, um, I would recommend using a cast iron pan on the grill so you get kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, but honestly, I have cooked steak every way humanly possible. And doing it in a cast iron pan, in my opinion, is the best flavor you're going to get. Um, 
it's going to be an awesome sear all the way around. So I'm going to quick walk you guys through kind of the steps that I'm going to take, and then we're going to get right into it. So first thing, we're going to season this thing, let it sit for a couple minutes. Um, I'll talk about that when we get there. Uh, and then I'm going to heat up the pan. I want medium high heat. I want the uh, temperature of that pan to be about four to 500 degrees. I'm going to put the steak in and then we're going to put some butter in that pan as well and then add our herbs and then we're going to baste over top of that with a butter mixture uh that that is just insanely awesome we're going to do two things we're actually imparting flavor into the steak but we're also creating a pan sauce for the end of this uh it's going to be going to be awesome so that's what we're going to do i'm going to talk a little bit more about just kind of steaks in general um the, the one really popular way to cook steaks right now is something called a reverse sear. Uh, and I, I get asked about it a lot. Um, when, when do I choose to do it and when do I not? And the simple answer is the thickness of the steak. So anytime I have a steak that is an inch and a half thick or more, I want to do a reverse sear. And for those of you who don't know what a reverse sear is, that is where you actually, at a lower temperature you start cooking the steak until the internal temp gets to almost done. And then you take it out and you put a sear on it at the end. Uh, so if you have a thicker steak, highly recommend that. For what I've got here, it's not super thick. It's a smaller cut. So I'm gonna do it all in the pan. And that is going to ensure that I get an awesome sear on it. So, those are the two main methods that I use for cooking steaks. I do get asked about sous vide quite a bit. Uh, and sous vide is great uh, for accuracy. You know you're not gonna overcook a steak if you do it sous vide. Um, however, I feel like there's a little bit missing uh, in the flavor department that you get, you get more flavor by doing the entire cook uh, either in the pan or on the grill or however you uh, choose to do it. So. Are there any questions before we get started? All right. So I'm gonna grab the seasoning and I'm gonna zoom in here and show you guys. There you go, <laughs> sweet. Um, so it's a little seasoning tip. Uh, anytime I'm seasoning basically anything, uh, I like to stay about a foot up off of the steak. Uh, the reason for that is it is so much more even in the coating. So I'm going to do that first side. Flip it. Now we're going to do the second side. Now, the reason I want it even is if you if you season down here close close to the steak, um, you're going to end up with spots that are a lot more seasoning and then some that are less. Uh, if you keep it up high, it just keeps it super consistent across. So every bite is going to have the same kind of flavor profile. You notice there's a bit of overspray. Uh, my my uh, little cheat for that is I just actually take my finger and I'm going to scrape back in any of the seasoning that uh, went outside of there and then roll the steak up on its sides. And now I can get the sides uh, seasoned. One thing I should say too is I pulled the steak out probably about a half an hour before we got started uh, and let it sit at room temperature. The reason to do this is to have less distance to travel as far as the heat on the inside. So I want this steak to be a perfect medium rare, uh, which is 130 degrees. If I start out at 35 degrees and start cooking the outside, uh, the inside is gonna take longer to come up to temperature. If I leave it out at room temperature and the inside of it is at like 55 or 60 degrees, uh, it, it's going to be a more even cook throughout. So I'll have a nice, uh, nice uh, sear on the outside, and then the inside will be pretty much the same color, as opposed to a heavy gradient where it goes from, 
you know, the sear to a well done to medium to medium rare. So uh, always important, pull out your steaks for a little bit, let them come up to temperature. Also, uh, I'm oh, going to let... Have one, we have one quick question. Yeah. Um, okay. Can we just repeat, someone asked, um, what's the name of the seasoning just one more time? Yes, the name of this seasoning is, this is Elk Creek uh, AP, which stands for all purpose. Um, oh, nice, okay. You can... And you can buy this at Northern Fire as well. Um, one of my absolute favorite seasonings for not just steaks, but vegetables, eggs. Uh, I give it as gifts to all my friends. <laughs> and uh, yeah, my best friend, his kids uh, call it elk sauce. And they're like, I want elk sauce on it. So <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's really good. I can also attest it is really good. I have one too. And I even like it on eggs too. Yes, um, on we great. do have one more quick question. How sure. difficult is it to find the A.W. Bavette? And I think I butchered that word. Um, are, who, the person who asked this, are you local to the Twin Cities? Shauna, I'm not quite sure. No, I'm not. So I'm okay. just curious how, to, how tough it would be to find it. Um, so what, what region are you in? I'm in Texas. I mean, so there are a lot of Wagyu farmers yeah. like around here. So I'm assuming okay. it probably won't be that tough. I just haven't heard of that cut before. So I'm curious. Right. Yeah. And, and in the U S it's, it's not a common one. Um, but I would go to, uh, first of all, any, any butcher, uh, you know, kind of smaller shop, they're going to know if you say a bavette, uh, flank steak, um, they're going to know what you mean. Uh, Got it. I think, you might have a decent luck at HEB. I've heard good things that they have a lot of different cuts there. So yeah, they do. Then that's good. I just wasn't, like I said, I hadn't heard that before. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great questions. Um, so once I get the seasoning on here, I'm actually going to let this sit for about five minutes. Uh, one of the reasons I'm doing this, uh, when the salt hits the surface of the meat, uh, osmosis begins and it starts to pull moisture to the surface. So you'll notice once you get uh, the rub on, the surface will start looking wet. Uh, this is good. We're actually taking some of that water content uh, from the surface and pulling it out. Uh, it really helps with the sear because if you have a ton of water content, um, it's going to steam more than it's going to cook the way we want it to. So a lot of people uh, like to do this overnight. Uh, you can certainly do that. You can season your steaks and, and put them in the fridge uh, to, to let more of that moisture come out. Uh, but if anybody here has had a dry aged steak, that is kind of what they do with dry aging is they'll actually take a steak, put it in a refrigerated area and run cold air over it. Um, and what that does is it evaporates the water content in the steak. And you would think, oh, that's going to dry it out and make it like beef jerky. And it's not the case because water is not actually good for tenderness or flavor. Um, so as you remove that water content, you're actually creating kind of a beef concentrate and you can actually get more tenderness and more flavor out of it that way. That's why uh, steaks that have been aged for a long time have the taste that they do. Um, I am working with this bavette, which is a, an incredibly, incredibly amazing cut, um, really high quality. So I know that this thing's going to taste amazing. I don't need to do much to it. Um, so I'm just going to give it like five minutes to help with the sear, let some of that moisture content come out. So while we are waiting for that, I'm going to kick on the skillet here. Now in my cast iron skillet, uh, and if you don't have a cast iron skillet, I would definitely say go get one. They are 20 bucks. You can get them at Target. Uh, just the cheap lodge uh, cast iron works awesome. Um, and, and it'll give you a sear that no other kind of pan does. So uh, definitely pick yourself up a cast iron pan. I do. I cook almost everything in that pan, and it's really awesome. So, uh I use about a teaspoon of grapeseed oil 
inside of that pan. And what I do is just a tiny bit in there and then a uh, paper towel, and then I just coat the inside. We're not gonna deep fry the steak, so I don't need a ton on there. I just need enough so that it doesn't stick to the pan. Um, and why I like to use grapeseed oil is because it has a higher smoke point, uh, meaning it, it can handle temperatures uh, higher than a lot of other oils before it starts to burn. Uh, and basically, the only thing I would suggest is don't use olive oil or butter uh, to cook your steak in. Now, I am going to add butter to it, but we're going to do that after the cook has started and we're going to keep it moving. So it's a little bit different. Uh, olive oil, on the other hand, um, has a smoke point around 350 degrees and we are going to be up in that four to 500. So we need something a little bit more. If you don't have grapeseed oil, uh, vegetable oil works great. Canola oil works great. Um, avocado oil is really good, uh, as well. However, it is not a neutral flavor. So I really like grape grapeseed because it's neutral flavored. Um, and it has that higher smoke point, uh, vegetable oil and canola oil are, are the same as well. So there's a, a little tip there. So I am going to reset this camera really quick and we're going to move over to the oven. So if you have any questions at this time, uh, give me a shout. Otherwise, give me 15 seconds and I'll be uh, set up over there. One. All right. Uh, one question that I get a lot is how do you know when the pan is ready? Um, and with grapeseed oil, uh, I can tell right away because you'll start to see the oil kind of get a little shimmery and then you'll start to see very small wisps of smoke, uh, coming off of there, which is, which is good. That's exactly what you're looking for. So we're not quite there yet, but we're getting close. I can feel kind of holding my hand up. We're, we're, uh, we're getting there. So again, I'm going to put this in the pan. I am going to let it kind of start to sear first. I'm going to flip it once and then I'm going to add the butter and the herbs. And then I have this, which is in my opinion, the most important tool you can have uh, in the kitchen. This is an instant read thermometer. So I know exactly what the temperature is of that steak uh, throughout the cook. Now, I'm going to teach you guys real quick the way to easily remember your steak doneness temperatures. So if you can remember that 120 degrees equals rare, then you can remember the rest because it's just 10 degree increments all the way up. So rare is 120, uh, medium rare is 130, medium 140, medium well is 150, and well done is 160 degrees. So if you can remember 120 is rare, then you can remember the rest. Now I'm going to get this in here and I want to pull this off slightly before I hit my target temperature, which is 130 degrees. So I'm going to pull this at about 125 because there is going to be some carryover cook that happens uh, after we pull this off the pan and let it rest. So I can see a little bit of uh, wispy smoke coming off. So we're going to get this right in the pan. And then I'm just gently kind of pushing it in there to make sure that I get that surface uh, coated and make sure that the entire surface is against the pan. Now, the reason cast iron is so great, again, is uh, something called the Maillard reaction. And that happens when heat uh, hits almost any kind of food, but meat, baked goods, things like that. Uh, the heat of the pan is actually interacting with the steak and the amino acids and the natural sugars uh, to create this awesome crust that is super flavorful. So you get flavors of a little bit of smokiness, uh, certainly a little bit of sweetness, nuttiness, things like that. So always, always, always make sure you got a good sear on your steak. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be kind of gray and lifeless and not much flavor to it. Uh, the Maillard reaction is also the thing, that perfect golden brown in baking, that is also the Maillard reaction. So 
Uh, a sear on a steak is not burnt. Uh, it is it is a very important step. So I'm going to give that about a minute on that first side. And then I like to use tongs to flip. Uh, you can certainly use other things. Um, you know, there's been kind of a, an argument back and forth about using a fork to do it. Um, you might lose a little bit of juice, but honestly, it's not that big of a deal. So if you like using the fork, you can. I just like the control uh, of the tongs. So you can see there, we're starting to get that mahogany color on that surface. That is perfect. That's exactly what we're looking for. Now, got about a minute and a half in on this thing. I'm actually going to take about three tablespoons of butter and I'm going to start melting that. And once I get that melted, I'm going to throw all the herbs. Uh, so this is again, um, thyme, rosemary, and garlic. That is kind of the holy trinity of, uh, of steak seasoning, in my opinion. Uh, and when I get this in here, you're going to hear the, the time will start to pop and snap a little bit. That's totally normal. That's just moisture getting released uh, from the heat. And then I leave the garlic cloves uh, in the wrapper. Uh, the reason for that is we want to keep these from burning. Uh, and that's a great way to protect them. You still get tons of flavor. Um, but you're also protecting the garlic a little bit. And then when we're done, you'll actually have some awesome like roasted garlic. If you just want to pop one of those in your mouth. Uh, it's, it's, it's really awesome. The flavor is great. So I'm actually going to tilt this pan forward and get these herbs kind of mingling in with that butter. All right. So we got our one side. We're going to flip again. Now, this is the fun part. So I'm going to take these herbs and I'm going to kind of put them on top of the steak a little bit. And then I'm going to tilt this forward. So all this liquid that's in here, I'm going to start basting that liquid right over the top of this steak. And again, this is, uh, this is imparting some awesome flavors, but we're also building a pan sauce. So at the end, when I go to serve this, uh, what's left in the pan is amazing flavor. Uh, so you just kind of dump that over top because that is mixing with the seasoning that we put on the steak. It's mixing with the herbs, the garlic. Um, it's also mixing with the rendered fat of the steak, which is really, really good flavor. So I'm just going to keep doing that a little bit. And if you've ever heard like only flip a steak once, uh, that's, that's all nonsense. Um, I subscribe to the just keep flipping method until the basically the, the sear that we're looking for when it looks the way you want it to, uh, as long as you don't overcook the steak, that's what we're looking for. So I'm going to flip again. So I'm running like one and a half to two minutes per side before I flip. So we're about four minutes in right now. And again, I'm not going to cook this to time. Uh, everybody who is on this call, you're, all of your steaks are going to be different. Even if we were cooking the exact same cut, uh, each steak is, is unique and will render differently and cook differently. So that's why the importance of having that instant read thermometer, uh, it, it's crucial because you will be able to know when that steak is done. The other thing, if you're working with Wagyu or some of the more heavily marbled steaks, it's tough to feel them and know that they're done just because there's so much fat in there. Um, it, it will feel soft even when it's overcooked. So I'm going to take my first temperature reading here and I'm at about 85 degrees in the dead center. So we're going to keep, keep working this thing now. I also have some sides to deal with. So I'm actually gonna take this thing and put it on its side. Again, the more I can get that sear on this steak, the more flavor that's gonna be. So I'm gonna continue basting. 
keep this butter moving. We don't want to char this uh, this butter. So very important to keep it moving. Keep pouring it over the top. All right. I'm going to flip this one more time. Now you can really start to see that mahogany color in this steak come out. And that is exactly what we're looking for. Really, really nice. Great flavor in that. Okay. Do this again. And sometimes it doesn't like to sit nice when you're tilting the pan. So I'm actually going to flip this around. So it's this way, and then when I tilt, it'll be right side up. Keep going on there. Okay, now we have a sear on the sides. So I'm gonna go back to this side, give it a little bit more love. Take another temperature reading and see where we're at. About 105 right there. I'd say it average about 105 throughout. So what I like to do when I'm taking temperature readings, uh, I start in the dead center and, and try to get, you know, right in the middle to see where it's at. And then I kind of check the sides too to see how, how the steak is cooking in different spots. All right. Now in a traditional like restaurant method, another thing you could do at this point, if you wanted to, you could take this whole pan and put it in the oven. Another good thing about cooking in cast iron. Uh, so if I had this uh, oven set at, you know, 375 degrees, I could put that in there. And in three to five minutes, I'd probably get pretty close to, uh, to my temperature. But again, this is a small enough cut that um, I'm just gonna do the whole thing in the pan and it's gonna turn out awesome. All right. Give me about five seconds here. We are gonna switch out a battery really quick. So hold on. All right, and we're back. Sorry about that. All right, I'm gonna flip again. And then I think this is probably getting pretty close to where this thing's gonna be good to go. It's not often you get to watch the entire cook happen uh, right in front of you. And in, in a lot of like TV shows and stuff, they cut away and magically it's done. So you guys get to see the whole process. And again, just keep keep that that butter moving. Everyone is loving it. The comment section is blowing up. Oh, I love it. Cool. <laughs> and again, feel free to take yourself uh, off mute and ask any questions if you want. Um, but yeah. All right, getting about one. Let's see. About 116 right in the dead center, so we are really close. Uh, like I said, when this thing gets to about 125, um, I'm going to pull it, and, uh, and then we're going to let it rest. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the importance of resting. Uh, super, super important. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the sides a little bit more love here. And uh, your kitchen might get a little smoky. That's okay. All right. I think we are getting pretty close. 
Yep. So I'm at almost still a little under 125. So I'm going to give it another 30 seconds or so on each side. And then uh, I think we'll be good. And notice this, this color is just beautiful. It's, uh, it's not black. It, it is this mahogany kind of dark. There's some red in it. That's how you know it's going to be a really, really good bite. Okay, let's take one more temperature reading, see where we're at. Perfect, right in that 125 zone. So I'm actually gonna pull this off, get it on a plate. Do not cut into it yet. I know it's the hardest thing to do, but I'm gonna take the, this pan and take it off of the heat so that we uh, have that uh, pan sauce to serve with uh, once the steak's done. So I'm actually gonna reset to our first position uh, give me another 10 seconds and we'll be right back with you. All right. So, uh, resting. Now the steak is off of the pan. The number one question I get about resting is whether or not I do something called tenting. Um, and tenting is where you, you actually take like a piece of aluminum foil and put it over the top of this. Um, with steaks, I do not do that. I just bring them out, let them sit in open air uh, for five minutes to rest. Um, one of the reasons I like five minutes, there was actually a study that was done where they took four steaks they were cut from the same primal the same animal they were cooked to the exact same temperature uh they were cooked in the identical way and then at the end they cut into one immediately uh they waited five minutes cut into one 10 minutes and 20 minutes uh and then they weighed the steak to see how much of the moisture had left uh at each stage um, and the difference between cutting into a steak immediately versus waiting even five minutes uh, was 20%. So one fifth of the juice that is in that steak ran out uh, is if, when they cut into it right away. So if you give it five minutes, um, those muscle fibers will start to uh, soak up some of that rendered fat and, and reabsorb that. Uh, and rendered fat, fat is flavor, <laughs> and it's also um, juiciness. When you take a bite of steak and you go, wow, that steak is juicy, uh, it's not water that gives you that. It is rendered fat. And so we want that fat, which is in an incredibly liquid form right now, to kind of reconstitute in those muscle fibers. And then when you take that bite, it's going to be insanely juicy, uh, insanely delicious, and and tender. So... Five minutes, super important. While we are waiting, a couple more here. Uh, are there any other questions? You know what? We actually had some nice comments. Um, cool. Great technical food information. I, I'm sitting here taking notes. I'm sure people are also <laughs> doing that. Um, I actually, I love Randy's comment. Um, Josh, Pinot Noir pairs well. I also love Josh. I'm sure it's a popular among many here. Another yeah. person said they have to drop, but this has been amazing. It's tough to focus for the rest of the day because <laughs> all she wants to do is eat steak now. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. Yes. Well, thank you thank guys. You. I, I really, great. I really, really appreciate it. So eh, we're almost there. So all in, um, that cook for this steak took about 10 minutes. Um, but again, when I'm cooking meat, I'm always cooking to temperature, uh, not by time. 
Uh, baking is definitely done by time, but uh, most things when you're cooking meat, it's all about temperature. Um, that's why super important uh, instant read thermometer. I'm going to say it one more time. Uh, I am not, I don't endorse these guys. They don't give me free stuff or anything like that, but this is the Thermapen uh, from a company called Thermalworks. Um, and this is like, this is the industry standard out there. Uh, these things are waterproof. Um, they're basically bulletproof. <laughs> I've dropped it. It's been covered in grease. It's been, and it still works awesome. Uh, you can definitely pick one of these up. Uh, they're right around a hundred bucks. If you don't want to spend that kind of money on an instant read thermometer, uh, you can definitely get other brands or stuff on Amazon, things like that for 20 bucks, 15 bucks, stuff like that. As long as you have something, uh, that you can go off of, uh, that is really what is important. But if, if I had to pick, I would have to say the, uh, Thermapen is my absolute favorite and it just, it's super simple. It operates like a pocket knife and you basically anywhere you stick this, it's going to tell you what the temperature is. So I use it on all my barbecue stuff. If I'm doing brisket or ribs or whatever, um, this is an invaluable tool. So very, very important. Oh, we do have someone here. Yeah. Matt, who also likes to grill. I do know that. Mm -hmm. um, he goes in complete agreement with you. If you're going to spend money on it, do it. It's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. Um, I own several of them now <laughs> just because. Oh, you oh know and what? I have... you one, one bit of advice. Don't, don't get the black one like I did. Because when you're working on a smoker or a grill or in a cabinet, they're really hard to see. So <laughs> they make these in all sorts of bright colors. Get yourself a bright color. So I bought another one that's actually uh, bright white, uh, and I can see it, uh, it, especially if I'm cooking at night and stuff. It, it works really well. So that would be my only tip. I also really love Randy's comment here, too. And I don't even know how to say this word. Randy, can you yeah. come off mute for a second? Because this is interesting. Sure. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a comment, or or uh, that uh, the the um the steak juice is sitting on a plate is not blood. That's right. But I, I don't even, What's that? Myoglobin, right? Yep. Yep. That's all. Yep. That is uh, that is that. absolutely right. So that's the best part. <laughs> It's so good. There's so much flavor in it. Um, trying to convince people that it's not blood uh, is is difficult because it's red and it's a liquid and it came out of a piece of meat. Um, but when the animal is butchered, they're drained of all blood. So there is none that exists in the muscle structure. Uh, all that was in the veins anyway. Um, so what you see is actually a combination of myoglobin and some of the uh, muscle, muscle tissue it actually tints it a little bit. So yes, absolutely right, Randy. That is not blood. You're not having a bloody steak. Okay. <laughs> I Now for the part that everybody is waiting for. I'm going to slice into this thing. Uh, so on this, on this steak, because, um, because it's shaped the way that it is, uh, and, and the grain structure of this, is running in this direction. It's kind of a combination of this direction and that direction. I always try to cut against the grain and I can see definitely right in here, it's gonna be a more tender bite if I do cut against the grain. Uh, not super important unless you're dealing with a cut that is a tougher cut. But uh, for presentation's sake, I'm actually gonna take this and you can actually, you can hear that crust is just solid. It's so good. All right. So because I had that thermopen, I know that that is a perfect medium rare. There's uh, you don't have to question it anymore. If you get one of those and then I'm going to come back with all those pan juices and dump those right over the top. And that, that is how I like to make a steak right there. Take a bite, see how we did. 
Mm-hmm. That is perfect. All right. Well, do you guys have any other questions? Doesn't really, so, right. doesn't really seem like the Go people ahead. are absolutely ruling. <laughs> well, thank you guys. I, I really appreciate it. And if you do think of something uh, after this, um, I will actually put, I'm going to put my social media handle in there. So I'm on Instagram, Facebook, um, Twitter, pretty much all of my, the website is BBQ with Boderman. Uh, if you think of a question, shoot me a private message. Uh, I absolutely love it. Um, I love talking to people about this stuff. I love people helping people out. Uh, and those of you who are going to uh, go to Northern Fire with your gift card. Uh, that is my absolute mecca. That is my favorite store. You're going to love it. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Have fun there. Check out all the things. They've got incredible cuts of meat, uh, seasonings, grills, everything. So uh, have fun there. But, again, if you guys have any other questions, feel free. I'm going to throw this in the chat. Also, if you check out his Instagram too, it's the photos are just amazing. <laughs> I I might be one Thank of the biggest fans. <laughs> I I see you liking stuff. I, I, thank you very oh, much. Yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, if you guys uh, check that out um, again, if, if you're looking for ideas for dinner, that kind of stuff, um, shoot me a message. If you're walking through the grocery store and you see pork tenderloins on sale, and you're like, I've never done that before. Uh, shoot me a message. I'll help you out. I, I absolutely love it. Um, I got into this to kind of take some of the pretentiousness out of cooking. Um, anybody can do this. It's super fun. And I just want everybody to have a blast doing it. So, all right. Well, if that's it, I'm going to jump off and uh, let you guys have the rest of your evening and uh, happy cooking. I really appreciate it. There is just raving thank yous coming in too. So <laughs> honestly, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. You I hope so everyone good. enjoyed the presentation today. I I also did record it in case you want to watch back the security part, you want to watch back the cooking part, all of the above. Um, but everyone.